Hi, welcome to episode two of the KRC Dream Podcast. This is your host, Jenny, and we have an exciting episode for you today. Our theme today is recess, but not the recess like the playtime breaks we used to get in elementary school. I mean congressional recess and what that means for immigration reform. Today, we'll talk about what a legislative visit is and share a story from a legislative visit for the California Dream Act in 2010. Then, we'll have a super quick and easy weekly call to action. Last, we'll talk about some misperceptions about deferred action and answer some of your questions. Welcome to the show. Today we have Dane Lee, who will be talking about his legislative visit to Mike David's office. Hi, Dane. How are you? Hi, Jenny. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on the show. No problem. So you're at Mike Davis's office. When was this? So this was back in May 2010, and we were there for a legislative visit with his office. What's a legislative visit? Oh, it's really cool. It's just a chance um, for regular people, community members, to talk with their elected officials about the concerns they have or their ideas about different policies. That's really cool. What was the purpose of your legislative visit? So for us, this was back in 2010 when the California DREAM Act was being debated in the California State Assembly. And so as you know, the California DREAM Act had two sections, AB 130 and 131. One of those sections allowed undocumented California students to access private scholarships for college, and the other part opened up Cal Grants, so need-based financial aid for undocumented college students. And so we were there to ask the representative, Assemblyman Mike Davis, to support the California Dream Act and vote yes. So what was the visit like? Um, it's pretty fun. It's really intimidating at first because we were at their um, at a Sacramento office in the state capitol building. And, you know, everything's really nice. There's marble floors. There's really fancy offices. And it's really intimidating. So we signed in with our whole group um, at the front desk of his office. They just had us wait for one of his staffers to talk with us, and we just you know, kind of nervously waited around and went over our talking points in our script. Hey, so how many people went with you? And there's about seven of us. There's a couple people from KRC, including seniors and staff. Back then, I was just a volunteer. And we also went with a delegation from Chirla and Dream Team LA. So that's so cool. When you got there, did you have a chance to speak yourself? Oh, uh, yeah. So I shared the story of a lot of my friends that I know who had a lot of trouble paying for college. I think that was the biggest thing about the California Dream Act. Even though with AB 540, a law that passed in 2001, all California students won the right to attend college and access education, we knew that without, if it was too expensive, it wasn't really accessible to all people. So we thought the California Dream Act would help a lot of people and just help everyone access their rights to an education. So did you meet with Mike Davis, or how did it go? I'm glad you asked that question. So originally, we were just supposed to meet with a staffer. I guess the assemblyman's schedule opened up, and he just kind of came out randomly right in the beginning of our meeting. And so it's really shocking at first, but it was cool because he took the time out of his day to meet with us in person. That must have been a great experience. Did you all have a good time? Yeah, you know, I told him the story of my friends and family members who, even though they were allowed to go to college and they earned the spot in college, they really couldn't afford it even after years of working part-time jobs and saving money while attending community college. And, you know, I just told him stories about people working jobs, tutoring or waiting tables at restaurants, friends who crashed on the floors and couches of their friends' apartments because they couldn't afford a dorm room, people I know who slept during the week in the library. And it seemed like some of them in Davis, he was really moved by this. Do you think he was supportive from the beginning, or do you think he made this reaction after your visit? I think our visit played a large part, especially the stories that me and the other members of the delegation shared, because he shared with us that after 2001 bill, AB 540, he thought this was an issue that was all solved already. He thought, hey, immigrants, even if they're undocumented, they can already access college. What more do they need? They can work hard, they can go to community college, and they can get a degree. And so he didn't know that it was so hard for people, even with all these rights, to still be able to afford college. And I think these stories really helped them kind of get a new perspective. That's really interesting because from what you're saying, he had no idea that mm-hmm. there was problems out there. Yeah, he didn't know. He didn't know. And because he made that legislative visit to highlight the issues, he was able to pass the AB 130 and 131. Right, and I think what that shows is how important sharing these stories are. A lot of times we might think that they don't make an impact, but in this case, these human stories really made him aware of an issue that 
he didn't oppose or support. He just didn't know that the issue existed in the first place. And so in the end, he ended up voting for the first part of the California Dream Act, the access to private scholarships. Unfortunately, he was absent during the vote for AB 131. We don't know why, but at least the bill passed. I think without this legislative visit and without similar efforts by different students and activists and nonprofits throughout the year, he might not have voted for the first part of the Dream Act. Oh, so it's Betty. So what was your overall experience? So overall, I think people were a little bit nervous at first. But I think a lot of elected officials are really good at putting people at ease. And so people were excited that they had a chance to share their stories and they were treated with respect and dignity. I know not every legislative visit is like that, but it's important that we keep trying. Thanks, Dane, for sharing. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. It was really fun talking to you. I'll talk to you again soon. Now this concludes our story segment. Our next section is the call to action section where you have the opportunity to get involved. This week's topic is Congress. We have with us today my friend named Carol. Hey Carol, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you, Jenny? I have a challenge for you. What is it? Do you know who your representative is? No, I don't actually. I don't think people in my age group know who their legislators are. That's true. I, I had no idea who my congressman was for a long time. That's unfortunate that we don't know who our legislators are because we have rights to meet them and to discuss with them what problems we're having and help them understand what we're going through. Do you know how to look up your representative? No, I don't. How do I look up my congressman? It's really easy. You can look it up online at www.house.gov slash representative slash find or www.whoismyrepresentative.com So, okay, I can either go to house.gov slash representative slash find or whoismyrepresentative.com with just my address? Yes, it's really easy to look up your legislator. You only need your address. So, good luck! And now, to all you listeners, I have a challenge for you. If you find your Congress member, Email me your name and your congress number, and I will be doing a raffle this week for a $5 gift card. What kind of gift card? Gift card is going to be a Starbucks gift card. So be sure to enter into this contest so I can give you the gift card. So that's this week's call to action. Go look up your congress number and email me your congress member's name. And that concludes our call to action segment. So this is our last section of our podcast today. It's the services with Jenny portion, where anybody could ask some questions about the board action or other questions they may have. Today we have Minji Lee, who has some questions for us. Hi, Hi Jenny. Jenny. Hello, how are you? I'm good. I had a few questions about DACA. And my first question is, a lot of people think that California Dream Act and DACA are the same things, and I wanted to know if they were. I heard that question a lot, too. California Dream Act and Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals are two very completely different programs. First, the California Dream Act allows students to apply and receive child grants, which is a needs-based financial program for students. Deferred Action is an immigration form of immigration relief, and it enables people to uh, apply for a work permit, um, get assurances that they will be deported, and in California, they could uh, apply for driver's licenses. So they're two very different programs. Oh, programs. so California Dream Act is for CAGA and DACA is for work permit. That's right. Okay, and my next question was, people and students with visas such as F1 or F2 or other dependent visas like E2, are they eligible for DACA? So the eligibility requirements, one of them requires that the applicant not have any status on June 15, 2012. If the applicant has F2 status or a derivative E2 status, unfortunately, they're not eligible to apply for the production. Okay, so they can't have any sort of status. That's correct. Even though it's unfortunate, right now it's a good time to keep your eyes and ears open for what's going on in immigration reform because there could be a new type of relief. Okay. And I also heard that there's an application fee for DACA. 
Yes, the application fee is $465, and the work permit lasts for two years. It's temporary, and when you reapply, you have to again pay that fee. Do you have any other questions? Yes, my last question is, how long is the wait after you send in your application? Okay, so after you send in your application, you should receive your receipt notice showing that you paid $465. That should arrive within two weeks. After you will receive your biometric notice within a month. And after you get your biometrics captured, you should receive your approval notice within four to six months. Yes. So everything takes about six to eight months. That's correct. Good question. Thanks, Minji, for all your questions. Now, if you have a question of your own, please feel free to email me at jenny at krcla.org. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions on our next podcast. Also, I just want to speak briefly about Deferred Action and the program, how incredibly exciting it was to be helping hundreds and hundreds of youth, young people apply for Deferred Action. However, it's worthy to know, like we discussed last week, that Deferred Action is a temporary form of relief and right now we are in high gear for comprehensive immigration reform, which will be an actual pathway to citizenship. So if you want more information on how to get involved with the Korean Resource Center, please feel free to email me, and we will be more than happy to plug you into any of our programs. That concludes our segment of services. And also, this concludes our weekly podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.